So, hello, good evening, and welcome to our 7th of June 2021 Tech on Tour R Jam. So, we started doing these back in 2011, 2012, I've forgotten the year, in the summer, in July. And in March of 2020, we all went into a lockdown. So, we've been running these online and uh, and if you're just joining us for the first time tonight, you're welcome. Um, if you come every month, you're, you're just as welcome. We'd love to see you. So it, what we've got for you tonight is we have lined up a bit of a showcase of projects and ideas and things that people have been looking at, all connected in some way to the theme Tech on Tour. And I said connected in some way, as in some are not connected in any way whatsoever, <laughs> and then others are very, very directly connected and we'll leave it for you to figure out. And why this theme? Well, we've had a theme every month. I think this idea was first suggested by Michael Horn of Pie Wars and Cam Jam. And he said, having a theme, it kind of focuses people's minds a little bit or it allows people to deviate or repeat. So um, a couple of things you need to know about tonight. So uh, already I want to say thank you or merci to all those people who are using their keyboard and they are typing things in the chat. So I asked a question just a moment ago. I asked, where are you joining us from? So if you want to, you could type that into the chat if you've got access to a keyboard. And another question I would be asking as well, well, we're told that in the UK at least, restrictions on travel are going to ease from the 21st of June, unless things change. And, um, if they do, where might you be going on tour? Or if you were going on a tech tour, say you were going somewhere amazing and you were taking some of your geeky techy friends, where might you take them? Um, and you could type, oh, well, Michael has suggested Potton in Bedfordshire. I, I don't know if he's answering the previous question. He's doing that to runny sketch, perhaps. So a couple of other things to mention about this evening. So we have seven presentations or talks lined up tonight. We call them lightning talks. We try to restrict people to a 10 minute window. We suggest they aim for five minutes. Most people like myself will usually go on for a little bit longer than that. Um, we have a running order as well. You've probably seen the program. If you're watching via your browser on YouTube, if you scroll down, what you can do is you can click and you can see the program and you can see who's up next. So at the moment, I'm, I'm filling in while Rachel and Erin will be joining us and they're going to be talking to us in a moment. But there's a few more things I just need to mention before we start. So um, I've, I'm encouraging you to join in the live chat. Simon, Simon is joining us from the other side of the table tonight. And Simon, I'm hoping you'll be able to give us some feedback a little bit later on. <laughs> so uh, a couple of questions for people in the chat. I've asked, where are you joining us from? If you could go on a tech tour in the future, where might, you know, what if I was to come and visit you? And you say, oh, Alan, because you're geeky and techy and you like, you should really come too. So where, what kind of places might you recommend? Now, one other thing to mention, we are recording this. So this is going live at the moment on YouTube and you can join in. And I'm also recording it. And maybe tomorrow morning or so, I will post uh, the recording online. So don't worry too much about what you put in the chat. So, um, Couple of things just to see if I can find it somewhere. I have a copy of the program. So here we go quickly. We have coming up next, we will have Erin and Rachel. It's mostly Erin and it's my microbit controlled greenhouse. It may be that if you were going on tour and you've got these plants that are growing, how are you gonna take care of them while you're away? You could ask a neighbor or maybe there's a piece of tech you could use. Then Paul will be joining us at 7.15. He's going to be talking about if you take your robot somewhere where you don't know what kind of terrain, um, then you'll be seeing me again at 7.25 where we're looking at our jam rejuvenated. So recently we asked people their opinions about what we should be doing in terms of do we return to physical events or hybrid events? So I'll be sharing some of that with you. And then we have four more. We have Ivan. We have a mystery guest joining us from somewhere on this planet. And then we have Carl, who's been building an e-bike. And then finally, Gary and his robot will be doing the locomotion. 
Now, um, Erin, are you ready now to start your presentation? Brilliant. And I'll see if I can mute Is my okay camera. Is it okay if I share my screen? Absolutely. Go ahead. You should be able to do that now. One of the advantages for people who watch the recording is all these like little fumbling about with screen sharing and stuff, you can just jump straight to it when we put the timestamps in. Okay, Erin, that looks like it's all working beautifully. So we moved house recently and our garden is quite big. And we're gonna have a vegetable patch and a greenhouse. Sometimes we go away and sometimes we forget or don't have time to water the plants outside. So I thought it would be a good idea to have a go at putting together the Smart Greenhouse Kit by Kittronic to see if it would give me some ideas and also to see how easy it is to use. I wanted to show a smiley face on the micro bit if the moisture if the moisture in the soil was good, and the sad face if there wasn't enough water. I, I just sowed some cress seeds because we can eat them, but I just sowed some um, yeah, cress seeds because we can eat them and we only put, need a small amount if we're putting them into our sandwiches. I wanted to press a button on the micro bit when it was sad, so the pump, so the pump in the water would pump out the water into the soil. Fail. Putting the wires into terminals was very tricky. I tried over and over again. I decided not to do that for now. I just wanted something to work. And it was very warm this weekend, weekend, and I just wanted to play in my new hammock. So I decided to leave the greenhouse kit for now and just concentrate on looking after the plant at home for the next two weeks using a microbit. This plant is for my dad for Father's Day, and I really want to make sure it looks healthy when I give it to him. I can check the micro bit every morning, see if it's happy or sad. And I've also got some like ideas for my next project. So I would install water butts so I can, um, instead of using tap water, wasting water, I could just use rainwater and we could get water but so it all collects into that and gets cleaned. So maybe I could use a water level sensor so I know if they're getting full so I can then empty them out and water other plants. And, and, and figure out how to use the water pump. I will make a small working model before we install anything. Just remember, it's okay to start really simple and work your way up. And I would use a water pump for my Barbie doll house so I can make a shower and a hot tub and just see how I like how the, like how it actually works. And thank you for watching this and I'm done. Is it okay if I ask a couple of questions? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it sounds a little bit like you had this great idea, but you might have bitten off a little bit more than you could chew. Have you ever heard that expression before? So sometimes people go like, oh, what we're going to do is going to build this great big, oh, well, hang on, we don't have enough of that. So you've had, what you've had to do is you've had to kind of think, mm, 
let's let's just get something to work. So sometimes people call that the minimum viable plan or product or something like that. So you've got something that works. Yeah. Yeah. And it works in a simple way, as in smiley face, the plant is happy. And then frowny face, the plant isn't. Yeah. So do you think, can you see that there's gonna be a problem that some plants like more water, for example, than others? So, so, so like maybe a cactus, for example, or cacti can survive for a long period of time without water, where some plants like tomato plants, they're quite thirsty and they need quite a lot. Can you see a problem with that? Um, or you hadn't thought about that yet? <laughs> yeah. So, so, it, so it may be that later, because this is, uh, somebody mentioned in chat, FAIL, which is first attempt in learning. It's an acronym. So they say like, well, we tried to do this. Then we discovered we had to do this, that and the other. So I suppose, when is Father's Day? 20th of June. Okay. So you've probably got a week or so where you could try it with some plants that are need a lot of water. And you could see how you because I, I presume you don't want to give it to your dad and say, look, this is brilliant. This will save you from killing plants. And then he relies on it. And then later well, on discovers. We've got like loads of plants. I've even got one right there, which is an absolutely massive one with big leaves. So, But that big plant there, and I hope, I hope that's not the one with the poisonous leaves that you've just touched, is it? <laughs> no, that's just uh, nice. Okay, you're still alive at the moment, but there's a plant like that that has leaves like that that are poisonous. And if you do touch them, they say what you mustn't do is you mustn't touch anything like furniture, you know, like plastic, like the arm of a chair. But you haven't done that, have you? No. No, so you should be fine. Um, but people say if those particular plants, I think they're called different back here. It's a good idea to go and wash your hands afterwards, because if it goes near your mouth and you start going, and it's, it might cause a problem later on and then we might be trying to find other things we can do with the micro bit so um is there a problem with electricity and water as well like what if you overwater the plant and you kill the plant and kill the micro bit at the same time oh your face looks like we haven't thought about that hmm. well, we well basically what we did is a sensor in the soil. So that goes to the micro bit, but it, it doesn't like send out like it's not electric, it's just like a sensor built inside it, but it's like waterproof metal. So it doesn't get wet inside it. So it doesn't go to the cable and break the micro bit. Okay, that is a good idea. I've, I think I've sometimes seen people use copper strips yeah. for, for this kind of thing. You can buy like this something you can buy this foil tape. I think it's supposed to keep slugs away, but you can. Or are you looking for it? Ah, okay. So it's like, the sensor's like up here, but it's like, you can feel it down here. So it, it doesn't give out any electrons. So I don't know if you know this, but there's a huge, well, there's lots of these around the country, but at a place called Kew Gardens near sort of west of London, they, they have these huge big glass houses and they have tropical plants from around the world. And they effectively use devices like the one that you've just shown us to monitor the, the life of the plants, to, to alert you to things like that. And also to, to make sure that the climate in the greenhouses is, uh, <laughs> is, is, just, is just the right level. So Erin, if you were to join us in, let's just hypothetically say a month or two months or three months, and that we asked you to come back and talk about this project, what things do you, do you think you might be telling us that you learned since this time? Uh, look into a crystal ball. What? If possible, we might have learned how to make the water pump work. Ah, okay. So that not only is it 
checking for the, con the humidity or the amount of moisture, it's sort of, it, you have like a feedback loop, like, oh, it's too dry, give it a little bit of water. Yeah, this is what um, this is. So um, at the bottom is this, this little pump holes. Yeah. Can't really see it. And then it's on the little stand, and there's a little indent in this little water bit, and you put it in, and it's meant to suck up the water into this part and go out of that part into this. But that has not been working. No matter how hard we've tried to put these little wires into the micro bit. What have you not tried yet? Um, have you well, tried switching it off and on again? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So well, <laughs> what have you not tried? Because it could be that in a month or two, you come back and you go, oh, do you remember I showed you that project? Well, we discovered there was a little break in the wire or, or something like that. So some troubleshooting. Erin, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you very much for joining us and for bringing your project along to show us. And it would be great to see a catch up in a month or two. Ah, Dave has mentioned in the chat that perhaps your pump is drawing too much current. There may be a way of supplying the current to the pump separately. And it may be because Dave knows somebody called Rachel and Rachel might ask Dave and, and Dave might have some little schematic. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, we'll do that. Okay, well, thank you very much. We now are going to go to another part of the country where somebody called Paul or Dr. Footleg as he is known to his millions of fans online. And Paul is on a tight schedule tonight. <laughs> I am, okay. unfortunately. I have another yeah, meeting no. later on. Well, we're just so glad you could join us. Okay. So I'm trying to do that thing where I hi I spotlight you. Um, and it's not coming up. I I'm going to have to get better at doing this. But uh, start as soon as you're ready, Paul. Okay. So when I saw the theme was tech on tour, I thought, what are the sort of problems that you typically face when you go on holiday? You're staying in accommodation that isn't your home, so you're not familiar. Um, often the, the accommodation listings don't go into details about kind of what sort of floor service, um, surfaces you're going to get in the accommodation. Um, it might be carpet, it might be hard floors, you just don't know. So you need a robot, obviously, that's going to be able to cope with a variety of terrain. And uh, I've built lots of wheeled robots that are great for driving around indoors on hard floors. Um, but I've always wanted to build something with tank tracks. So when I saw a YouTube video of someone who had built a 3D printed tank that where they were driving around in the snow and mud, I thought kind of that would be quite a good project um, to, to kind of have, have a play with. So I printed off one of the track links from their, their track. Um, and you can see the part here is actually in two pieces because I had a print failure on this one. But I was actually surprised how big it was. If you've kind of, I don't know if you can see the scale there, it's about 75 millimeters across. And you can imagine making a tank with tracks where each part's that big. It's going to be absolutely enormous, um, a lot bigger than the kind of scale of things that I normally build. So I thought, well, the first thing to do is to, to kind of downsize that. Um, and so I got on CAD and uh, designed myself a scaled down version that takes um, M2.5 millimeter screws and nuts rather than I think this was based on M3. So now I had a, a link design. Um, of course, the next thing to do was print a whole load of them. And uh, I did that. Um, I'll show you a picture in just a minute of, um, of those tank tracks. Um, but as well as the links, you also need drive wheels. So I started investigating kind of designing cogs. And uh, the idea is that the track link fits so that two of its um, adjacent kind of curved parts fit into the spacing of the cog wheel. And uh, at this point, I had to brush off my um, school maths, do a bit of trigonometry because I wanted to be able to make cogs of different sizes. And by using a few equations in the CAD program, I was actually able to, uh, to kind of do it so that I could put in, um, I'm trying to hold them so that you can see them on the camera better. I could put in how many notches I wanted and it would 
resize the wheel to the right diameter so that I always had exactly the right spacing between these notches. Once that problem was solved, we could then make wheels that are actually the full width of the tracks. So um, you can see the profile has got the notches, but now they're the full width and the tracks rest so that they sit over that central ridge. And that's important for tank tracks because otherwise they slide sideways off the, off the wheel. So we had a link design, we had a wheel design. You can see it's got a hexagonal hole to take the motor hubs that are commonly on motors. I had a set of Pyborg motors and uh, we had a tank. So let me just share my monitor and I can show you. So here you can see the first printed test track um, with a couple of wheels. Um, I designed it so it could take a, a long shoulder bolt for the front axle and then the Pyborg motors plugged in. And you can see there's lots of screws on there that are um, going through holding the links together. So we had a viable design. If I just, oh, where's the, I always lose the screen share stop button. Um, so I then made enough of them to make two, two tracks. And I was thinking kind of like, how am I actually going to build the chassis for this? And I came up with the idea, I had this aluminium extrusion and uh, I thought that would be a really good kind of way to build a, a kind of prototype because really I wanted to test the tracks. I wasn't building the final robot of it. And the great thing about this aluminium extrusion is that you can bolt things onto it anywhere along its length. So I designed a whole set of brackets. So you can see on the front wheel there, I've got a bracket that bolts onto the extrusion um, that takes the axle, the nut for the, for the front axle. So that's kind of like enables that wheel to turn. On the back, I designed some blocks like this. Um, and what they do is they, they slot over the extrusion so that you can bolt a motor bracket on. So it's got four holes there. Two of them you can see hold it onto the extrusion, but it also has a bolt hole going through the length of it. So you can bolt it onto the extrusion in two directions. So really solid anchor for the motors. And you can see that there's a, um, a big kind of plate that's also 3D printed. That's holding my batteries and my Raspberry Pi. Um, so I've got a kind of standard fixing for putting a Raspberry Pi onto one of these frames of aluminium extrusion. And I can tension the tracks just by loosening the bolts and sliding these brackets along so I can get the, the kind of right amount of tension because you don't want these to be too floppy or they tend to fall off. So you can see there's a bit of slack in them, um, but not so much that they're under kind of a huge amount of strain. So you can tune that just by loosening the bolts, slide it along, tighten them up again. And I also thought it'd be really good to be able to see how this robot's behaving. And so I made a little GoPro mount that also fits onto aluminium extrusion. So you can see that bolted on there, just has a bolt in each side and uh, takes, it's a standard GoPro fixing so I can fix any of my GoPro hardware on. So let's see how it behaved in action. Um, let me go back to the screen share. So here you can see me driving it around on the tiled floor in the kitchen. As you would expect, um, 3D printed PLA filament doesn't have an awful lot of grip on a shiny surface, but it was actually immense fun to drive because you could drift with it. So um, I built my first drifting tank and uh, that, was, uh, that was actually quite good fun. Um, probably difficult to control if you wanted to do fine motion, but for skidding around on the floor, um, really good. So the next test was to take it outside onto some more rugged terrain. I haven't got a video of it running on carpet, but actually it was designed really to kind of run on carpet. And it's, it's great for bombing around the house um, because the PLA digs into uh, the carpet quite nicely. But outside, how did we get on? Well, you can see it runs quite nicely on a concrete path, but the, uh, the ultimate test of how strong my PLA links were I was half expecting them to break as soon as I started kind of thrashing them about. And, uh, and sure enough, um, on the first test run, 
that's what happened. I'll let you see that again. I don't know how well it comes across on Zoom. That looks really clear and, and um, entertaining as well at the same time. Yeah, so I was running the GoPro at 200 frames a second so I could slow it down to, to get that slow motion. Um, now, that link that broke, um, it just kind of snapped at one of the joints and I replaced it because I have three, uh, 3D printed a few spares and uh, was back out um, up and running with it. And uh, we managed a few more runs. Just... Let this run. We're just missing the sound effects. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the sound from my video is playing through a different speaker and uh, it's pretty loud and clattery. If you can imagine that, there's not a lot, a lot of other audio. But once I'd fixed that, that link, I was able to, to bomb this around the garden. And you can see that the GoPro gives me a really nice angle so I can see what the robot's doing, but I can also see kind of where it's going. And uh, it was fantastic on the paths. So, of course, the next thing to try was driving it on the grass. And uh, unfortunately, I found that the motors didn't have enough oomph to, to drive it on the grass. As soon as I got onto the grass, um, the drag from the, the motor, I don't know if there's a, any grass driving in this particular clip. I think possibly the previous clip had some. Let's have a look. Yeah. So you can see it's really struggling to move on the grass, but as soon as it's off, it whizzes along. Now these are quite high speed motors, so they haven't got a lot of torque. Torque is like the rotational force that the motor can exert on the wheels. Um, so I probably want to use some lower geared, slower, but more torquey motors to drive on, on difficult terrain. But you can see there, because of the, the GoPro on the back, when I speed up, it can do wheelies. And, uh, and I drove this around in the garden for quite some time. I also tested it on the gravel and uh, it was actually all right on the gravel where the gravel was hard packed. So where the car had driven over the gravel, um, it could drive quite well. When it got into slightly kind of deeper gravel, it struggled and, and you had to kind of just let it creep along until it got onto a harder surface again. So, but really the purpose of this test was to, to kind of thrash the, uh, the PLA tracks um, into submission to try and destroy them because I wanted to check before I go and kind of continue iterating on the design um, was the actual linkage mechanism strong enough did I need to print these thicker and redesign the wheels to take kind of slightly chunkier tracks and actually they held up really well so I was very pleased with this initial test um, now the goal is to actually design different types of track link so that I can um, take off that kind of really sharp spike um, sort of surface, which is good for soft kind of terrain and replace it with different things. Um, for example, I'm gonna try and print some rubberized um, track links um, and see if I can actually make a composite where I print the, the PLA, use the PLA, the hard plastic filament for the part that attaches to the, the nuts and bolts, but then slots a rubberized 3D printed piece with the TPU filament, which is the the kind of more rubbery filament and, and make something that maybe grips a little bit better on the kitchen floor. So that was all I had to show. Um, I'm happy to answer questions and... Uh... Well, I've just got a short one for you, which is um, I've noticed, and I don't know if many other people have, a lot of your work appears in Magpie magazine, Hackspace magazine. Does, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, so it, it, I'm always quite excited when one of my projects appears. Um, nearly all of them get discovered because I reply to the Raspberry Pi Foundation or the magazine's found, um, tweets. So every Monday, for example, the Magpie magazine tweets with the hashtag Magpie Monday um, and says kind of what have you been up to at the weekend? Share your Raspberry Pi projects. And um, so I often, if I've done something involving a Raspberry Pi, reply to that and uh, they will pick those tweets up and they'll feature in their kind of 
what have readers been doing this month feature. So that's one way that my stuff got into um, Magpie magazine on, on several occasions. The other one was they did, I think during March, they did a month of making hashtag, which they ran across both those magazines. Um, and I posted a few things, a few tweets with month of making. And from that, they contacted me and, and asked, kind of, could they do a little feature on one of my robots that was a month of making project? Um, but they also picked up some of my other tweets. So my chicken coop project appeared in there. Um, and in the past, my 3D printed cat's bum, also famously, I think that was my first magpie appearance, was my cat's bum, um, which was my attempt at designing a much more curvy um, kind of robot cat to 3D print, a, a project which I still need to get back to. And uh, we'll no doubt be sharing in the future when I, I return to it. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. And for those people who don't know, um, Magpie magazine, Hackspace magazine, you can subscribe to them. They are paper-based magazines, but you can also download them for free digitally. And you can see some of Paul's projects printed in the magazine. And anybody could submit projects if they choose to for those magazines. There's a whole back catalogue I strongly recommend. If you don't already read them digitally or whatever, go look for Magpie and Hackspace magazine. Paul, we're looking forward to seeing you again with some more fantastic projects that looked amazing. Thank you. Okay. Always happy to, uh, to join. So Paul has to dash off. And what I'm going to do now, um, what I could do is, I was going to share with you something, but somebody's joined us a little bit earlier, a mystery guest, but maybe we should just stick to the plan. Let's stick to the plan for now. So um, we sent out a poll in May and I had this idea, let's call it the May poll. And then after we've done the poll, as in a form or a survey, we can gather around the May poll. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share some of the results of the May poll with you. So um, I just need to go and share my screen. So give me a moment while I do that. Uh, I need to choose the right browser window. Okay. And then if I go into present mode, you should now be able to see. Okay. So now I did also say, Gary, would you mind joining me just in case there's some details or whatever that I don't properly see or, or, or draw attention to. So thank you for joining me, Gary. So Gary is one of the, the crew that helps this wonderful event come together every month. Um, topping and tailing and all those other things. So uh, the questions that we sent out, so we've got 47 responses. I think I asked 400 people or so if they would contribute to the, or, or complete the poll. Uh, so the first question was, where are you joining us from? So um, it, if you look at this graph on here, I think what it serves to illustrate is that at least two thirds of people who join us are not in our neighborhood. They're, <laughs> You know, so Gary and I, we happen to live and do our activities in the northwest of England. So I'm based in Preston, Gary a little bit further south. Um, and we're in the minority because 63% are somewhere else, either in the UK, and we've got a less than 10% outside of the UK or, or doesn't fit into one of those. OK, so there's the first little bit of surprise. Uh, of course, when we were doing our physical events where people would come along, then you would expect it was different that closer to 100%. So I also asked people again, just to give a little bit of background and context to their responses when they last attended one of our events. So you could, if you lump some of these together, so if you look at like say the last year or so, the blue, red and amber, um, that roughly off the top of my head, that's, a, a slight, that, that's close to 75%. So three quarters of people who filled in the poll have attended one of our events online in the last year or so, and nobody did fill the poll in. It hasn't, um, but there's a small number of people. What we're saying is, or what they're telling us is, they filled in the form, but they haven't attended any of our online events. So I'll go to the next. So we've got so a couple of questions. So we ask people, why do you come to our events? Um, so the, the most popular answers seem to be to be inspired to see what the likes of Erin and Paul are, are, are working on uh, for their own personal development, just because they're curious about discovering new things. And then the other answers that were fairly popular, sharing the social and networking. 
I, I was surprised support was a little bit lower than I thought, but I suppose this is perhaps more to do with our physical event. So often people would turn up at our physical event, oh, I won this Raspberry Pi in a competition, don't know what to do with it. And often people needed a, a, you know, an SD card setting up properly or something like that. Um, and um, there we go. So, so I suppose no surprises there really why people come to our, our events. Oh, I need to go back one. So, so we're putting forward a proposal at the moment you know, we've got this idea that on the 21st of June, restrictions will be eased, but as there's new variants, D and other ones that haven't been named yet, will we be returning to more physical events? So we're exploring the idea of still doing the Monday night jams, but is there a way we could do it where we combine physical with virtual? Gary, if you want, jump in at any moment to interrupt me. Don't feel oh, it's okay. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so the lightning talks, since we've been doing our jams online, they are pretty much 100% lightning talks, the first hour and a half. And then we go to the breakout rooms where people just chat and show and extended amounts of time talking to each other. So our plan is with, if we were to return to Monday night jams, we'd schedule them in advance, but we'd try to enc encourage people to present either online or physically in the space. And, and, and we've been talking about how we might do that and how feasible that might be. And then the other thing that would be tricky, and we'd have to try some of these things to see how they work, which would be, could we have in tandem or in parallel, like tables where people can just sit around and listen and talk and maintain the online breakout rooms? I don't know if that's trying to do too many things. So Here's what our survey said. So 20% um, of the people replied. So out of 47, that is 10 people of the, of the 47 said that they would plant, or nine, <laughs> said that they would come to a Monday night jam. Um, but- Actually, what, Alan, if I can ask a question at yeah. this point, um, we've got about 47 responses there. How many people did you actually send requests to uh you know in order to get answers so, to. so i sent the request out to everybody who had ever registered for a ticket for any of our events physical right and okay. online yeah um now some of the people who registered for physical events and uh, so if i sent it out via eventbrite and i know a lot of people they don't get the eventbrite emails because they're spam yeah. filter or whatever so we were going to see a small return so one of the things I think you're highlighting Gary or you're, you're inferring is a large amount of the people who've replied are people who are our warmest fans that have been coming to our events more regularly recently. Yeah. Um, so there is an audience that haven't responded and haven't replied who are the people who turn up at our physical events and we're not hearing from them through our poll. <clears throat> right okay. so, so it could well be that um, it could be more um, than we see here will we'll actually turn up on the uh, on the night yeah certainly um at our previous physical events we i don't think we ever had one where there was as few as nine people no. i'd say the quietest ones we ever had might have been 15 or 20 and we had some yeah. really busy ones that, where we had 80 or 100 people i was going to say i think i counted 70 on one occasion when i thought yeah. it seems like you know a lot so and, yeah and then the other thing that the poll doesn't take into consideration is if if say it's a parent who filled in the poll and they normally yes, put two children cool. and somebody sure. else so it doesn't take a group into consideration uh -huh. but what it does show is there's a lot there's still going to be a large appetite for an online element if we if we went 100 physical monday only there's maybe 40 people who replied we're going to, and i don't know they could all be the people who are watching us tonight yeah yeah Okay, I'm going to move on to the second proposal. I'm doing it. I'm trying to slow down a little bit in case there's a gap there. You want to interrupt me, Gary? So the second one was, so something we've had before. It's not a new idea. Is uh, uh, in other places around the world they have these maker fairs, and I mean to use all the branding costs a lot of money. But there are other events that are like a maker fair where people have stalls or tables, and I start to wonder if we're still have some element of social distancing restrictions in place? Could we perhaps police a kind of 
you know, socially distanced fair. I've seen it happen outdoors. I've been to some kind of uh, country markets and things like that where people are selling jams and cheeses and things. So I was trying to see whether... Anybody selling raspberry jams at all? Um, I can't say I was looking, but uh, <laughs> I'd have jumped on it if, if so. So, um, so our proposal is uh, that maybe three times in a year, we might run a Super Saturday, which would really be a Saturday morning sort of thing. It would be a fair where we might get a handful of people would sign up in advance to say they will commission a table or take a table from us and they will put things on that table. And so, for example, if it was you, Gary, and you brought your robot along, you might disband with a table and say, Gary's robot doesn't need a table, he, he is the table, or you, it might inspire some creative project. Somebody else, like if Simon Monk, for example, who lives near us, had some kits, he wanted to demonstrate something he was working on, a prototype, he might want to do that. Simon uh, Walters might want a table to show off some RA into tech. He's, anyway, I think I've explained that. So, um, and then after that, people could organize their own lunches, go off and do other things together if go to the library <laughs> or whatever. And then I thought maybe we could have a very small. So here's what our survey said. So we got quite a positive response to this one in terms of people wanting to attend. So we've got, um, you know, again, of the 47, so just over a third of those said that they would try to attend in person. Or, so another question at this point, Alan, because yeah. um, quite a large proportion of people were from outside of the immediate area and, and what appears to be um, a bigger proportion of people than, than who live in the area say they'll actually attend. So that seems to be quite encouraging that people are going to prepare to, be, to travel from certainly you know, far There's away. Uh, a few of the people who've joined us from Scotland uh, who are just not here right now at the moment, yeah. but they have said, oh, well, I'd probably come down the night before, stay in a prim... Preston's got lots of travel lodges and premier inns and this budget. And I don't know, some people might even say, oh, I'll put you up at our house, Scott. We've got a spare room or something like that. Because I think it's, I know there's definitely an urge and need. People want to start to get back to see each other face to face. But we're all, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out the most sensible way of moving they, forward. They can all stay in the east wing of O'Donoghue Mansion. <laughs> Uh, well, there aren't any rooms eastwards, so they would be outside on the grass. Oh, right. Right, <laughs> so uh, let's see what else we got. And a, a quarter of those 47 said they'd, they'd be unlikely to attend. Um, one of the things I'm hoping if we were to go down this route, that if there was, say, uh, families or schools, that they might be able to organise a minibus to get there for the 10 o'clock thing. And it could just be that you just come for one hour of the two and go away um, but again we haven't done this kind of thing before so we'd have to try it and see and I suppose if we could get a venue and everything goes ahead as planned we might be looking to try one maybe the end of August or so and I think that was the last one that's all I've got to show so um, in the notes on the YouTube description and all of the emails, the events and everything. We're saying if you've got any thoughts or suggestions as a feedback form, I'm forever telling people about filling in the feedback form. If you've got any strong feelings about any of these, please let us know. But all I can say is we've we've definitely grown in not just in terms of numbers, but we've grown and developed as a result of going online. And I kind of wished we'd started it a long time ago and we don't want to lose the new community there's somebody our, our secret mystery guest who will be joining us a little bit later on is just an example of that i think it's time for me and gary to turn our cameras off now and we're going to go to our next presentation so we have if if i've got it right following our schedule it's it should be ivan next is that correct ivan ivan's on mute at the moment So Ivan, are you ready to present now? So um, Ivan is going to be talking to us about how we might monitor air quality. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think so.
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Am I am I live now? You are. You are. <laughs> Seems to be a bit of a delay. But... Yeah, the live the live stream is about thirty seconds behind this session. Ah. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna have to just close that. I think. Yeah, it'll it it's it can be a little bit of a distraction if you're watching this at the same time. <laughs> so I just stay in the main room. Is that? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. You, people are watching you now. And I can now. close if I close YouTube, or just mute it, or how's that, Alan? Um, yeah, I can see you. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Sorry about that. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, Alan's asked me to talk about a little project that I um, put together. Uh, it probably started about a month ago, um, probably month, six weeks, something like that. Uh, I'd, I'd noticed that um, Mike Horn had put um, a, a project together that he's, he's called the the, the Pico Pike Order, uh, which I thought, yeah, it's a, it's a really nice idea. Um, so I put together my own, well, but basically I took um, Mike's code and, and created that. Um, and then I thought I'd, I'd like to just take it a little bit further to trying to find out a little bit more about how the uh, the graphics works. Um, uh, use some of the, uh, the the same sensors that Mike had used, but also um, probably didn't want to use all, all the sensors that, that, that Mike had used. So I, I sort of removed bits and added bits and it's just sort of slowly evolved really. So as I say, it's it's, um, it's using a Pi Pico, um, based on um, Mike's Mike's original project, um, and it's um, I'll, I'll show you the what I've what I've actually put together. Um, so it's sort of sort of just about finished now. There, there might be one or two other bits and pieces that I do to it, but but basically it's um, a, a graphical user interface, which if anyone is a Star Trek fan would probably recognized as being from, you know, probably from the, the flight deck of the, the Defiant on Deep, Deep Space Nine or, or something like that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, that, that sort of style display um, and it's just it's giving me information such as uh, where well, this sort of weather information on there. So things like um, atmospheric pressure, temperature, humidity, um, air quality as well. Uh, it's also got uh, a UV meter in as well, so it will show you uh, UV light levels. Um, so as I say, I can actually, you might see if I if I turn this light on, that the display might change a little bit. Not a lot. It, it doesn't seem to be so, so so affected by. Yeah, it sort of changes a little bit as you as you change the illumination in the room, but it's more based on UV rather than just sort of ambient light levels. Um, so it's, it says, yeah, it's a Pi Pico. It's got a sort of three and a half inch uh, TFT display with a, an SPI interface. Um, a number of uh, I2C sensors as well. So there's a BME 680 sensor, which gives air quality, temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, the, the the UV a UVB sensor as well, and I've also put a, um, an I two C uh, real time clock in there as well. I've I've tried two or three different real time clocks, uh, some slightly better than others. Um, I'm using one at the moment. It's called it's a DS thirty two thirty one precision real time clock. Now I'm not sure how precision it is, but it's it's reasonably accurate. Um, I had tried another one which wasn't really very accurate. It was, it was, I think, losing, you know, sort of a few seconds an hour. Um, so, I mean, in terms of RTC accuracy, it's, I didn't think that was that great. But the one I've got in there at the moment seems to be pretty good. Um, I've also put a number of buttons on there as well. So, if you want to be able to do various things. So, the main thing is you can switch off the display if you want to. So, if I press that button there, it will switch off the display um, and then the, the little green LED just sort of shows that the the device is sort of active as it were, but uh, the display is off and then press the button again. Um, 
the other button, which I won't press at the moment because I think it's still not quite working 100%, is the reset button. And the idea is that you, um, you if you, it shouldn't, when you press the button, it shouldn't reset, but it does sometimes reset the, the thing altogether. Um, uh, there's an LED at the bottom as well, which uh, is supposed to light up when the, the power is on. So it's actually, um, there's a battery inside it, so it will work off battery as well as um, power. Um, but you switch the power off, then the LED goes off. Um, but this one, the, the one in the middle, that's the effectively the reset button. Um, and that normally just pressing it shouldn't do anything. But if I flick that up, then that then means if I press that button, the um, it will reset, which is just done. So as I say, it's, it's not working 100% at the moment. Um, so it's, it's, it seems to have reset itself. It's, it's still it's still sort of slightly work in progress. Um, so it's so it does need a bit more work on it, as, as, as you can see for, from that. Um, trying to think what else I can say. Oh, I've, I've also, as well as the um, air pressure or atmospheric pressure, I always I thought it's it's useful to be able to see um, sort of change in pressure, atmospheric pressure over a period of time. So see where the uh, air, atmospheric pressure is, is is rising or falling. So there's also a little um, little graph display there. But as I say, because the um, because it's just reset itself, that graph is effectively just a straight line. It's just because it's it's um, a volatile graph. It, it's not stored anywhere um, at the moment. That's that's one of the improvements I'd like to make is to get it to store sort of past readings. So in theory, that should give you a graph of the atmospheric pressure over the last, um, I, think, I think it's about six hours, something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are the main, the main sort of things about it. The, uh, at the moment, it's coded using CircuitPython. Um, uh, and, and really the reason I've done use CircuitPython is, is simply because that's the only, um, code I could find that to, to drive the, the TFT display. But if I ever find some C code that will drive the, um, the, the display, then probably what I'll do is convert everything to, to C code. I mean, the reason being that, you know, CircuitPython, um, you're sort of limited to the, well, I mean, because it's a, um, a microcontroller, there is a limit to the amount of RAM that you've got available, which is, uh, I think, 264K. For the um, for the Pico, and I have actually found that very very occasionally I do actually hit that limit. So it might be running for a while, and then it will just say it can't allocate any more memory. Um, so it, it's pretty much on the limit at the moment with all the the things I've got on there. So what I'd like to be able to do is recode it in C and and see if that will actually improve that and allow me to 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 add extra things to it. Ivan, is it okay if I ask a question? certainly is. Uh, so I'm going to ask you another one then. Um, so I know <laughs> yeah. I've seen sometimes when we've met diving equipment and I know you like to go sub aqua diving. I do yeah yeah I haven't when been you, for quite some time. No but I know when you go on a dive you're kind of at the mercy are you of the air cylinders you take underwater with you? Uh, yeah well yes yeah you've only got a limited amount of air. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Is there any practical way that it might be possible to monitor the quality of the air from your cylinders using such a device? Quality or the quantity? Quality, like, because... Yeah, well, there, there are, you, you can get uh, analyzers for, for analyzing air quality. Um, I mean, the, the, the one that's in here is it wouldn't be ac nearly as accurate enough uh, to, to, or certainly I wouldn't trust it to be accurate okay. enough to analyze air that I was going to be breathing uh, under pressure. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you, you can get analyzers that will um, analyze, you know, uh, you know, particulates in air and stuff like that, uh, you know, uh, percentage of oxygen detect things like obviously carbon monoxide is something you wouldn't want in, in air that you were breathing underwater. Um, well, you wouldn't want it you know, breathing on, on anywhere, but underwater it's even even worse. Okay. Well, thank you, you very much. Get sensors that, that okay. do that, yeah. 
Well, Ivan, thank you very much for for joining us and showing us your your project. And we hope to Thanks see you again. Me. Thank you. So um, we are. I'm just going to update you. We're about 10 minutes behind schedule at the moment. Um, and we have a few more presentations lined up in a moment. We're going to go over to our mystery guest. We have a new feature we're adding in this month. So um, what I'm going to be doing in a moment is introducing our mystery guest. And before I do that, I just want to update you on what's happening next. After our mystery guest, we're then going to go over to Carl Bentley, who has been building his own e-bike and he's going to show us what's involved with that. So I've just muted Carl for the moment. So, so Carl, you're after our mystery guest. And then we're going to finish off with Gary and his robot doing the locomotion. Now, I'm going to ask our mystery guest to make a, an appearance. And we're going to... So this was actually a suggestion. We, we, we run a feedback form at the end of every jam. And I always say to people, please fill in the feedback. And hardly anybody ever does and there's usually two or three people do and i want to say thank you to some of those particularly catherine and spencer and they both suggested we should have guests on from time to time and we should do a q and a so earlier this afternoon i went on twitter and i thought who would and it just came up in front of me our mystery guest so i asked our mystery guest would you mind joining us and mystery guest said what's involved. So, mystery guest, you're on mute. Would you like to introduce yourself so we know? Take away the mystery, please. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I go on Twitter by the name of Cleo QC, so it's not my real name, but QC might give you a hint of where I hail from, if you are familiar with North America. I am actually from Quebec. And French is my first language, and so please forgive the pronunciation accent over there. And uh, I am outside right now because we are in a heat wave, uh, even though it's Canada, and we do have, have heat waves. It is 34 Celsius right now, and it feels like 39 with the humidity. Wow. Très chaud, or trop chaud. Oui. <laughs> so. Oh, uh, I love the heat, so I'm fine outside. Okay. so. There's a time zone difference between where we are here and you. So it's about five hours. And you're telling it's, us it's really hot there in the afternoon. It's top of the heat right now. It's okay. 2 p.m. going on to 3. So it's probably the hottest part of the day. Now, would you describe yourself perhaps as an engineer? Would you say that's your job title or? Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit more than that. <laughs> I'm uh, director of engineering for ah. a robotics company. And you now let me take you back quite a few years. Um, it doesn't probably doesn't show on camera, but there's a lot of gray in that hair. Um, I used to work as a developer in the graphics environments, uh, 2D and 3D doing uh, special effects for movies where we're actually doing the tools for graphic artists to do their effects. And um, we got bought by Microsoft. So I ended up being a developer for Microsoft for about five years until I quit everything in disgust to stay home and homeschool my kids. So my eldest has just graduated from university. We did not homeschool university, but we did homeschool all the way to university. And she's now out. And the second one is going to be graduating next year. So I've homeschooled for 15, 16 years out of the tech world. And when it was time to you know, figure out what I was supposed to be doing after homeschooling, that's when the Raspberry Pi appeared out of nowhere. So I got one, the very early one. It was, we're a little bit behind. So it was 2013 for me, not 2012. And uh, I had forgotten everything. I couldn't do anything at all. <laughs> couldn't code anything. And the community was like very welcoming and I'm still in touch with a lot of the uh, UK people who helped me out in getting my, my mojo back <laughs> and um, getting started with like, blinking LEDs like we all do and slowly Python was new to me, Python didn't exist or was just barely 
out of its crib when I quit tech. Um, so I had to relearn everything. And then I got hired by one of the robotics company that makes a Raspberry Pi based robot. As Is this a Dexter Industries? De Dexter Industries, yes. I got hired as a, an educational specialist to write a uh, curriculum for the robot. And from then, I moved into engineering. I ended up CTO. Wow. So en engineering, uh, technical lead, uh, <laughs> educator, teacher, yep. all of those, <laughs> all, uh, yeah. tout ensemble. <laughs> tout ensemble, yeah. yes. So, and about a year and a half ago, almost two years actually now, two years ago, uh, Dexter Industries got bought by another robotics company called Modular Robotics. So at Modular Robotics, I am a uh, director of engineering. Okay. So do you still own a Raspberry Pi computer? Yes. But Just and actually, the answer should be no, because I don't own a Raspberry Pi computer. I probably have 20, 25 Pis in the house. Okay. <laughs> so that would be plus de 25, more than 25. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Is, that, is that the only kind of digital maker platform you use or do you do you find you use things like arduino microbits and or yes we did have a we did create a microbit robot so uh we have a uh no i have tons of microbits i did a lot of teaching with microbits love teaching with microbits so easy compared to the raspberry pi and uh yeah so we had a little robot uh, the gigglebot that was microbit based and gigglebot also offered well, it offered the MakeCode interface, but it also offered the uh, MicroPython. It was integrated in EduBlocks for people who are trying to make the merge, the, the switch from blocks to Python. And, and, and other than that, yeah, I have a couple of Arduinos. I don't really like Arduinos. Um, it's kind of funny because I used to be a C programmer, but yeah, I don't know. I never clicked really with the Arduino. And then, of course, I started with the uh, the PyCode as everybody else. <laughs> Um, I did say to our audience on YouTube if they had any questions, but all we've had so far, and I'm going to try and pronounce it, so forgive me. So it's Bienvenue à la confiture de framboise. That's, <laughs> that's from Dave Gallup, which I think roughly translates to saying, Welcome to the jam of raspberries. Framboise yes. is like the fruit of the wood. Yes. Okay. And co confiture is, is jam. Yes. So, so good, um, good, good, good work there. It's a good word. So well done, Dave. Dave Gallup, he's been practicing his, his French. Now, um, would you say that the Raspberry Pi is still, it's still a good device to use or do you, do you still use it quite a lot or do you find that you're moving to other, other devices? Do you, do you stick with Raspberry Pi all the time or you try to I'm actually like going back in technology because with modular robotics, they have well, modular robots you know, that are not really meant for hacking. They're really meant for teachers in the classroom, teachers who have no technical background. And these, they just work. You just you know, snap them together, together with magnets. Yeah. And uh, depending on how you assemble them, you'll have a different behavior. Uh, you can coat them. There is a little... Uh, uh, block the interface so that you can change the behavior of the blocks. Right now, here I have a knob, you know, and it will control ah. this light over here, and it okay. will control the motors just by moving the knob. And I have a distance sensor in front. I don't know if she's going to show, but being outside is very sensitive to uh, natural light, so it, I can't really showcase it today <laughs> because I'm outside. You, you're in the wrong climate. <laughs> well, the wrong day. <laughs> Uh, right. I, so I asked our audience if they have any questions. So we have a question from our audience, which is, what does a director of engineering do day to day? So what would a typical Ooh. day be like for you? <laughs> well, we are uh, designing new stuff. And actually, part of my job is uh, finding contractors uh, for what we need to do, because we go, it really depends on what we need to be doing recruitment uh, trying then, to find the right teams to fix yes. the problem yeah, okay yes well we mostly work with contractors because we are very very small team so we, we go with short-term contracts 
from when we need something. And right now I am working with somebody in the UK. So uh, because it's kind of my network, I'm returning the favor in a sense, not the same person, but it's, we develop a network in the UK. So that's where I know people. And uh, I supervise manufacturing in China. And I make sure that all the websites are running uh, all the time. And on the Go Pi Go, which I haven't shown yet, uh, I make sure that we keep it up to date and that it has the right software in it for the kids. So this is my main, my main platform, I can say, which is Raspberry Pi based. It's a robot for the classroom, um, as opposed to one that you would design yourself. This is really more for coding. So it's for teachers who are kind of happy, like kind of comfortable with tech, but not too much. And if you don't know if you would, we have, I might show you this it's, little red, reddish LED over here yeah, that basically tells, tells the user that this robot right now is not connected to a Wi-Fi network. So if you want it, you can visually debug the state of your robot. So, so what's very yeah, nice I'm is if, if it doesn't work properly, the programmer can blame the hardware. It's not my yeah, problem. It's totally. a hardware problem. <laughs> <laughs> So when you boot when you boot the Raspberry Pi up, it um, gives a Wi-Fi connection and access point. So you change your laptop to connect to the robot, and you get it runs a website. So you will connect to the website on the robot, and it has a blocky interface if you're learning how to code. And while you drop the blocks, you can see the Python code getting assembled. And if you switch to Python, you actually switch to Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, and all the advanced libraries are, are preloaded for you. So you can do machine learning with it. You can do data science. It's all already on the Raspberry Pi, out of the box. Can I ask one final question? Est-ce yeah. que j'ai posé uh, l'ultima question? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so the question is, I noticed I think you and I have been on Twitter for since 2009. I think we both joined around the same time. What is it about Twitter that makes you keep going back there? Do you, <laughs> why, why there? What, what, what do you get from it? From Twitter, I definitely, I get uh, my network, my professional PLN that the teachers call my professional learning network. Um, and it's nice that, I can get at the same time and mix with my tech people and with my teachers. So I don't have to go to different like forums or different pages on, on Facebook. They're all mixed together. And it's easy for, for me to connect people together. It's like, oh, you need to talk to that person because they're all in the same platform. But occasionally, I suppose you might just get random requests from people asking you to do things that you're not too comfortable about, like. Would you like to come along and be a mystery guest, for example? <laughs> Sometimes it <laughs> so, happens. <laughs> yes. They're best ignored, you know, if you get those kind of requests. I um, almost did. I so almost did. Shall I call you Cleo? I do answer to Cleo. I've been using that name since 1992. On Twitter, Cleo. No, there was no Twitter at that time. Yeah. 1992 Cleo. is a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> So if people were to go and look on Twitter at Cleo QC, which is underscore QC, underscore QC, is that an abbreviation for Quebec or Quebec, Canada? Is it... QC is Quebec. QC is Quebec. OK. Yes. Quebecois. Quebecois. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, Cleo, thank you very much for joining us and fitting us into your busy engineering daily schedule. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Bye. Uh, Thanks for having me. À la prochaine. À la prochaine. Next time, okay, words. Next time. Next time, words. That's live. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Okay. And now we are going to be joined by Carl. Now, Carl, I muted you earlier, so you will need to unmute yourself. And <laughs> and I think I've spotted you as well. You have. So, yeah. So, Carl, I was on Twitter and I saw you sharing some details of your e-bike project. I'm like, wow, this will be perfect for our tech on tour jam. And you've got some slides with some photos to show. Because yeah. that's I did we was kind of hoping you might be able to present from your e-bike, but I suppose there's a uh, safety implication there. It's locked away in the shed. So. Okay. 
Okay, Carl, so show us, tell us about this e-bike and... Well, I've always been, I'm a, a motorcyclist as well as a cyclist. And I've, 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 every year I, used, I tend to do a big, long uh, charity ride. So the London to Brighton, Pilgrim's Trust. Um, and every year it's got harder and harder. And um, I was looking at e-bikes thinking, how can I get, how can I flatten these hills? <laughs> so, and I had a couple of bicycles and I thought, oh, and one of them is, is my favourite bike I've had for nearly 30 years. It's, it's the same frame, but new wheels and everything else. Um, and it's a road bike. And I thought, I'll, I shall have a go at turning that into an e-bike. And I did a lot of research. And that was my first go. And I learned a lot from doing that, as I'll, I'll explain in a minute. And then I, I had a fold-up bike that I used to take around with me. And um, I decided I would have a go at that, but slightly differently. So I've done two now. Um, so if you'd like me to take you through them, I will. Yeah. It sounds like an incredible project. I mean, I've seen... If you go on certain social media platforms, you see these adverts for, oh, buy this retro kit and you can turn your old Triumph bicycle into a Tesla kind of, mm. and I think, mm, <laughs> really? Yeah, uh, the, I, well, I'll explain some of that as well, um, because some of the kits are horrendously expensive. Um, but some of them are very nice and very simple to, they, they oversimplify. You have to do a few things to make your, your e-bike safe. Um, there are a few rules and laws you have to abide. Um, because you are basically adding another rider to your bicycle. You know, the, the, the motor you're allowed to have on the road is the equivalent to someone cycling for you. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that as well. So yeah, that was, that was the impetus. And I've, I've done a couple of cycling tours around Kent since I made them and it has made life a lot easier. <laughs> so. With the assistance of technology. So you're, you're gonna show us some photos. Yeah, yeah? I shall show my screen. Yeah. And then we'll, uh, Right, let me start this slideshow. Ooh, beautiful looking photograph. And, here and we you are. should be able to yeah. see the words appearing at the bottom. There you go. That should work. Yeah. Um, so, building your own e-bike. Uh, you will need to build an e-bike. You will need a bike, a usable bike. There's no good trying to turn a clunker into an e-bike because you'll just end up with an e-clunker. E you need a decent bike, a bike you like to ride because it's gonna have the same riding properties in terms of physical comfort that it had before. Um, so, so choose a bike you like riding. So it has to be usable and in good condition. Um, you'll need a motor. And the motors are coming in three, fur, three basic fur versions. There's a front wheel one, uh, a rear wheel one, and a mid-drive one. I'm just going to talk about the front wheel and rear wheel ones here, because the mid-drive ones I've found to be rather complicated and expensive. So you can have a front wheel drive one, like I've here, which is direct drive, it means there's no gears involved, and there's no brushes either. Or you can have a rear wheel drive one. Here, I've got a rear wheel drive, which has gear, cyclical gears built into it, which is why it's so compact. There are benefits to front wheel drive on. Um, it's more direct. Um, it actually gives you higher top end speed. The benefits to the rear wheel drive on is it gives you more drive in the wet, uh, especially out of corners. And it tends to be faster up hills, but not give you the same um, top end. They are limited. The maximum on the road you're allowed is 250 watts. If you want any more than that, then you have to use it off road. That's, that's the law. Okay. So. You also need a battery and a battery holder. Now the battery needs to match the motor and the controller. Uh, batteries come in lots of different voltage types. They're all DC, um, ranging from 30 volts up to, well, you can get higher than 48 volts now. Most of them are around 36 volts, run around 36 or 48 volts. And they come in lots of different amperages or amp hours as well. I've gone for 13 amp hour ones, which tend to give me with, with the system I've got about 30, 35 miles range with pedal assist. So they're the batteries. I, I've, and the batteries, um, you can either buy them from eBay or you can buy them from the battery companies. There are a couple of big battery companies where it's usually a better, better quality to buy them from them. They've got standard uh, lithium ion batteries in packs inside of them. If you pull the ends off, you'll just get lots of these little batteries um, that look like this inside of them. Lots of these all soldered together or uh, uh, welded together rather uh, inside of them. So big back packs of them and a controller. You also get a charger with them and a carrier. The, the, the black thing is the carrier that they all fit in. So they, they, there are different shapes and models. Some hang off the 
um, the middle of the frame, some hang off the bottom frame, some of the more modern ones hang off the handlebars so you can take them away with you. Um, the other thing you need is control units and they come in lots of different shapes and sizes and do lots of different things. The basic control unit gives you full power when either you pedal or you use the thumb throttle control. The more uh, advanced control units give you lots more options like how much power to give you as well as your pedaling or how much power to give you when you push the, the throttle, the uh, thumb throttle open. My original controller on my first bike was this big unit and I swapped over for a much smaller and much more comp, uh, much more uh, a smarter small one. Now the control units are actually very cheap. If you know what you're buying, you can pick one up for about 30 quid. Um, lots of wiring though. So you need a control unit. Um, you also need somewhere to put the control units. On my very first bike, my touring bike, it hung off the frame on a, in a little bag. Uh, later on, when I made, used a much smaller control unit, I managed to fit in the back of the battery pack. I was a little bit concerned it was going to get too hot in there, uh, but I also added in a, a temperature monitor, and it's never been above 37 degrees or 30, 38 degrees, um, even climbing hills. So it seems to be where I put lots of little holes in this, by the way. Um, so that's some air in. So it seems to be working there, and there's plenty of uh, space around it as well. So it seems to be working quite well. Um, and both of my bikes now have the controllers in the back of the battery pack. So you also need uh, the bar mounted controls uh, and in, uh, an indicator to tell you what's going on and what's called PASS, um, pedal assisted. Um, um, it, it's, it's a pedal assisted sensor. So the controls you need on the bar, you need a thumb throttle, thumb throttle, or you can get a twist grip throttle, thumb throttle. I'm a motorcyclist and I tend to usually have my throttle on my right hand, but my foldaway bike has its gear controls on the right hand. So I put it on the left hand, there's a little thumb uh, switch here, uh, which gives you, it's, uh, it's just a um, variable resistor really. Um, that tells the controller how much power you want. On the controller unit here, it, it, it lets me, uh, on this particular controller, have four, uh, sorry, three levels of power. So low, medium or high, uh, low, half power or full power. It also tells me with the three, uh, the four little LEDs, how much battery life I've got left, which is quite handy. The other thing you need um, is they on if you buy a kit, you normally get new handlebar levers, which have switches built into them. Because when you put the brakes on, you also want to kill the power to the motor. Because the last thing you want is the wheels keep spinning while you're trying to brake. So they have switches built in, which tell controller to cut the power, front and rear, um, and that's really useful. Uh, this is the, the uh, pedal uh, assist sensor. All it is is a pickup and a bunch of magnets, uh, and you have to get the right one to go with. So it depends on the controller. The controller sometimes is looking at different pulses to see how much you're pedaling. And you can set it up that um, it either waits for you to be pedaling a lot or pedaling a little before it switches the power in. I still got it midway. So after a couple of revolutions, it goes, haha, you're pedaling, have some power. If, I, if I've got the system turned on. So you need those controls as well. And of course, to tie them all together, you need a bunch of wiring. Now they are getting much, but most of this stuff is made in China and they are getting much more, they are getting better at um, having everything in the same color code and same connections. They weren't like this. Um, I, I got very good at changing connections over, but they're actually getting some more consistency out. There are mainly about two or three big companies churning all this stuff out in, in China. There are other companies, there are American companies and British companies and other companies too, but a lot of the stuff is basically sourced in China, especially the motors. And I have no idea why that is, why we can't make motors and, and controllers in this country. I have no idea. Um, so you need a whole bunch of wiring. On my, uh, and connectors, on my uh, road bike, uh, you can see the wiring runs back to the controller and there. Uh, and then the, the power also runs back to the controller. On my um, foldaway bike, it's a lot neater. Uh, I got much better at doing my foldaway bike was my second one. I got much better at doing this. So um, but you do need the wires and connectors and you do need to know how to use a soldering iron or a crimp um, if you want to change things. But most of them, if you buy a kit, most of them come ready with all the right connectors. You just push them together and they work. So the cost. A wheel kit with a motor from somewhere like eBay, uh, control, handlebar controls, all the stuff you need, minus the battery, 
you can start about 150 quid going up to right 300 400 quid of course you pay for what you get um and they do a whole range of wheel sizes i've got 26 inch wheels and i've got 20 inch wheels there they also do the modern 700 cc size sizes they do a whole range of sizes and you can choose front wheel or back wheel Batteries, uh, they start at around 165 quid, depending on the, um, the ampage and the voltage as well. Again, going up to four or 500 pounds if you want a really uh, high tech, modern, a high power 20 amp, 48 volt battery. Um, they're coming onto the market now and I'm waiting, the thing I'm waiting for is, are these uh, dry batteries, these, um, the latest uh, uh, incarnation of uh, battery technology that's gonna come along into the system in the next sort of five years because they're twice the power and half the weight, which is going to be fantastic. Now, um, it, a lot of this depends on your own level of expertise in, in putting electronics together. You can, you can, as I found, buy the individual bits for a lot less. We have to make sure they all work together. Um, for example, as I said before, my updated controller is only 30 quid off eBay, and it does a lot more, and I, I could integrate it with all the bits I had already. The thing you have to do, though, is you have to do your research. You really do have to research, 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 read around it, look what's on eBay, go see what people are saying on Twitter, look on the, the different bike, e-bike forums, which are a bunch of Americans. Are. The Americans are a bit more ahead of us here. And they are, are much more lax about their rules in different states. They can go up to a thousand watts on their on the, So they're like little motorbikes, basically. And of course, we have the famous um, uh, TV, uh, TV personality, uh, crashing his e-bike, didn't we? Because uh, he didn't have, didn't realise it was so powerful. Um, so check out eBay, Amazon, YouTube until until you get to know what's what if you're going to do your own conversion, um, which is not that hard. Um, but I would say be wary of buying other folks' unfinished projects because they've probably burnt the controllers up by wiring it up wrong. Um, there are I've, I was looking on eBay earlier, and there's a few of them knocking around. Um, and one thing, if you do a pre-build, if you get all the stuff out and build on the on the dining room table, be careful. A 250 watt motor spinning a 26 inch wheel is quite powerful and it will have your fingers off. Um, so be very, very, very careful. And a 36 amp, uh, sorry, a 36 volt, 13 amp battery will melt wires and set them on fire if you're not careful with it. Uh, there's a lot of power in those in those battery packs. So check and check again your wiring and connections before you switch it on. Um, and that's my that's my bit. If you now I can go back and show the, the pictures. So um, I think it's important, although you did allude to this already, that we just mentioned some of the safety aspects because we do have a mixed audience, and I can imagine some of the younger and some of the some of the old <laughs> members as well ah. going like, "Wow, this is brilliant!" Yeah. Um, what are the kind of safety considerations like? like head protection i presume would oh, yeah. an ordinary you, cycle yeah, helmet be all, I, yeah I, I wear all the normal cycle stuff um so a, 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 a traditional cycle helmet is fine just cycle stuff yes there yeah. we go uh, all the normal stuff uh, cycling gloves uh, all the rest um uh it's the maximum speed out of one of these is probably going to be about 20 miles an hour um the great thing is going up hills though you know, sort of my my foldaway bike will do 11 miles an hour up a hill uh, without me pedaling at all and my mountain bike type one will do nine miles an hour up a hill without me pedaling at all on the on the throttle uh, and they really do flatten hills out and it, me it means people my age um, or people who have um, sort of less or, or less fit if you like can get out on a bicycle and not be frightened of hills um, so the range is about 30 35 miles if you're cycling as well um, so you can enjoy the flat bits and then enjoy the, the hilly bits even more because you're not totally um, worn out by attempting these hills anymore. It, and if you're not having to work, hills, yeah. if you're not having to work as hard on the hills as well, and you're turning up to a meeting on your bike, you're probably not yeah. going to be quite and as that, warm. And uh, and that was research they found in America. They thought that people weren't going to be, were going to be less fit because of this. And what they found is people actually ride the bikes more and actually go to work on in, on them because they're not getting there all sweaty and they don't have to get changed. They can just wear normal clothes and ride these bikes. And the other great thing was it was reducing travel time a lot for these people. So that was and a, what about the job. weight as well? Because, you know, I used to cycle quite a lot and occasionally you drop your bike or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, the, the front wheel's fairly heavy on the, the front wheel bomb and the battery's, you know, a lump. Um, 
but they're not unmanageable by any, by any means. No. We've had an interesting question from Dave who asks, does it have the option to recharge on downhill? Like yes, yes, some of the really posh ones, which wow. are in thousands, have um, have that charging ability, uh, and and the and brakes as well. Yeah, the regenerative braking. Regenerative braking. Yeah, yeah. That, I know uh, they use that in really, some of the modern trains. Yeah, yeah they're the really um, uh, really posh off road ones um, with the big uh, high powered motors, uh, and you can also have if you really wanted um, a motor on both ends. So this is a, a DIY project, and. How long have you had it? So a year or so? Or? I built my first one about two years ago, okay. and my, another one a year ago, and I redid the first one again with new controllers and bits and pieces so, and a new pedal assist. So where I'm going with this is I'm thinking, well, you're the first person I know who's done a DIY e-bike project, and maybe in another year or two, I might know two or three other people. Where would you see this from 10 years from now? Do you think that the price is going to come down, the efficiency? Yeah, because you're, you're paying, like my foldaway bike, if you wanted to buy that uh, as it is in the shop, it's about a £1,000. Just uh, the bike itself? That the, the e-bike the, oh, the okay. e version. Yeah. Whereas but the ordinary version is like 300 quid. So it's still, it's still worth doing it. If you've got the bike already, it's worth doing it. But the prices will come down. The, um, the, I guess the most expensive bit is going to be the battery. Um, I, can't, I can't see them coming down in price soon because there's a shortage of batteries, basically, because everybody's used them in everything. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, I can see more and more people use them, especially to go to work. Uh, and you can see that with scooters, these electric scooters are becoming really fashionable um, because they just take the... Um, but I think the bike's nicer because you, at least you get some exercise. <laughs> um, and we've had another comment as well in our chat that... Um, apparently it's illegal to just drive without pedaling so it has to be pedal assist is that yeah, right it has to be pedal assist um yeah. you, uh, you can have the thumb throttle so you can't just go off and thumb. one of the safe things about an e-bike is when you move away just on the thumb throttle it, it it gives you drive straight away so you don't wobble off a start or if you're going on the, from a stop on to a right a left hand corner you can go around quite smoothly so that's quite handy. So it stops that wobbling away from the traffic lights quite nicely, especially when you're loaded up with, with what I am with, with all my camping stuff and everything. So that's re that's quite safe, really, for a lot of riders. But the law basically is a 250 watt bit. Okay. And because I know pedals, yeah. you definitely have to have pedals, it's like a moped. The <laughs> some of the news would have us believe that there's well, it could be true that there's a a growing uh, number of people using the e-scooters and because we're not so used to these and the legislation isn't perhaps as sharp and up to date as it could be that there are hooligans taking over our streets. Well, the great thing about the e-scooters yeah, yeah. the, the latest versions and we've got a trial here at Canterbury at the moment is they're going to fit they're being fitted with a GPS so as soon as you go onto the pavement it will stop ah. not suddenly it'll sl it'll yeah. slops fairly quickly it won't let you go uh, uh, out of the zone you're supposed to be in and it won't let you go on pavements because the GPS is, is smart enough to know where it is. So that's quite handy. And it's also smart enough to know that you can't just dump it somewhere uh, as that's the other problem with scooters at the moment. Um, they're just being left everywhere. But the next generation of scooters, because um, it was last May they started, wasn't it? So the, it runs for a whole year. So um, they're, they're, it's all coming up for a renewal, all this stuff. But the GPS thing is going to be really good um, about stopping scooters being misused in shopping centres and things like that. So, and it's illegal to have a uh, to run a private one anywhere. Anywhere, ah, uh, you can't use any scooter anywhere if it's private. You can only use a rented one on the road, and you have to use a rented one on the road. Okay, Carl, it's been really lovely to have you, especially oh, because a lot of the projects that we see, they are projects, they're prototypes where people are thinking that maybe this could be different, but this is highly practical and and you know and it's beneficial to helping people like yourself get out there <laughs> more often yeah so thank you very much right we have our final presentation this evening and uh, which is gary gary also has a project that he's considering how he is going to make that mobile and yeah, my, my project isn't highly practical, <laughs> <laughs> isn't complete. <laughs> so I, 
so there's a feature in Zoom where we can pin, I can spotlight people, not pin. And I, I have to learn how to use this more because I don't always have the option to do that. But I'll just switch off my camera. <laughs> and Gary, you can just start. Tell right. us about your project. OK, um, I'm still seeing you rather than me as the main uh, presenter here, but we'll, we'll carry on regardless. Um, yeah, this is the latest uh, episode of my project. Uh, robot project has been going on for well what seems like years now I suppose um, and uh, I just thought well we'll have a, have a cozy fireside chat this month and uh, I will just tell you a little bit about what's uh, what I've been doing with it. Um, despite the, uh, the, the title uh, do the locomotion I'm not going to be having the robot dancing tonight that was last month um, but so what I did want to do is just show you some of the changes that I have been making recently. Um, these Robots, uh, I say these robots, humanoid robots generally, when you see them on, people presenting them on YouTube and so on, they um, very often, uh, you only see them from the waist upwards. Uh, and there's a very good reason for that, which is because making them move around is actually quite a tricky um, thing to do. So I, um, I've always had this robot so that it could move, and as I've explained in the past, it's based on a Meccano mechanoid robot. And up until now, um, the only way in which it could actually uh, move around on the floor was by using the original Meccano uh, wheels. And if you actually look at the, I've, I've split the thing in half so you can get a better look at it. Um, and you can see here, um, this is the, uh, the the foot of the robot, and it's got this rather small wheel here, which is which is driven by a small um, motor. And one of the difficulties I've found with it is that it's fine if it's on a smooth surface, but if it's um, going to be moving over anything which is even slightly rough terrain, um, and this takes us back to uh, Dr. Footleg's uh, presentation of earlier, um, then what we find is that uh, it can easily get um, held up. There's not much, much ground clearance there, there's probably less than a, a centimetre of, of ground clearance. So if it's got to go up, say, from a flat floor onto uh, a rug, or something like that, then it could easily get held up. So I decided I'd equip it with something a bit more um, powerful. I'll give you bigger wheels, and uh, I would also um, give it some a, a more powerful motor. And if I just show you a comparison of what I've done here, the um, original motor, which um, I've taken out of the uh, out of the base of one of these things. Is, is that big. So you've got a little, um, the fact that, that silver thing there is the motor itself, it's a little six volt motor, and there's a, a plastic gearbox attached to it. And what I decided to do was to replace it. So that's uh, now I've got a much bigger um, motor there. And you can see the, um, the, the black part on this one, if I just hold it up there. Uh, is equivalent to the silver part of the little one. So it's, it's, it's quite a lot bigger. It's probably, I don't know, five to six times bigger than that. And the silver part on this one is the gearbox. And unlike the one that was originally on the robot, which was made out of plastic, with plastic gears, this one is, um, is metal with, with metal gears. So it's a much more robust thing all around and delivers a lot more torque as... Uh, Right. Apologies. I have done something I shouldn't have done. <laughs> Gary will be back in a moment. And I'm back. You're back. <laughs> Apologies. OK, as you were, you were describing the difference between the motors. Yep. Yep. OK. I'm still getting a rather peculiar view of you here. Actually, I'm, I'm seeing you, but not me, I'm only just seeing me. As a really tiny person, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But anyway, that's, that's just because enough. you're presenting, okay? Right, okay, okay. Um, so uh, yeah, the so we see the difference in the sizes of the motors. So, and the other thing I need to do is to change the size of the wheels. Now, the original wheels on the robot were that big, and I've replaced them with wheels which are that big, which is a significant difference. Uh, it means also that we can get a lot more ground clearance. We can get it with much bigger bumps. Um, I got those wheels, by the way, from. B&Q for about £2.70, so good value for money. So what I've done is I've um, I'll just switched views on the camera here so you can see uh, they, what I've done. 
Okay, so you can see on the table in front of me here then, that is the new setup now. You can see the, uh, the wheel there. You can see the motor mounted behind it. And um, all of this um, unit here is, um, is being 3D printed from PLA plastic. Again, the same sort of stuff that Dr. Footleg was using in his earlier video. So I, I not exactly copied the design of the foot on the original Meccano robot. There's a lot of, um, of inspiration, shall we say, uh, from there. So it's got a, it's got a leading um, driven wheel um, and a trailing caster. So basically, there will be two of these, and they'll be fitted to the bottom of the legs of the, of the robot. I've not fitted them yet because uh, what uh, Dr. Footleg didn't mention um, when he was. Uh, talking about the uh, the printing of the PLA is it takes a heck of a long time to print this stuff off. So that top plate, for instance, took about five hours to, to print. So that doesn't include design time, of course. And that little trailing uh, section that's got the caster on it, that took another three hours. And then each of the individual um, other parts, these clamps and, um, and uh, uh, the axle holders and the gears, again, they took some of them between two and three hours each to print. So you're looking at a day or two of, of actual just pure printing time on these things. Um, so uh, it, it does take a while, but uh, provided you get your design right, and, and incidentally, I've used Tinkercad for all my designs here, no, no high powered professional software for me. I've just gone for the cheapy stuff um, because obviously what we're about here is to try and um, uh, well, be inspirational perhaps for, for hobbyists and for young people that haven't got lots of experience in using uh, more, the more sophisticated software. So I try to do everything as simply as I, as I possibly can. So um, yeah, uh, that was basically that. I'll just, I'll plug it in um, and we'll give it a little go. So you can see it working. Now at the moment, I've just simply got it plugged into a power supply. Um, so there's no sophisticated control on it, but I will probably use either an Arduino as I often do with these things, or I'll use a, um, Raspberry Pi with a with a hat to drive it. So let's plug that in. Okay, and then we can switch. Right, so we switch on, and then away it goes. So you can see it's just well, it's not actually rotating. So I've messed something up somewhere. Never mind. Um, I have to take my word for it. It does work, and it does give a much um, stronger pull than the original gearbox and wheel. Now, okay, that's where we're at at the moment with this thing. Um, obviously the dream would be to create a robot that could actually walk. But the problem with that is that it, um, it takes a lot, well, it takes a lot more motors to make that happen. And um, you probably need a couple of motors, two or three motors maybe in each, uh, each hip motor in, the knee and probably one at the ankle as well. And the sorts of forces that we're talking about here are pretty huge. Uh, so you'd need um, some, some very big motors, which would probably cost somewhere between 100 and 200 pounds each. So you could be looking at thousand, a couple of thousand pounds to equip a robot with uh, all the motors that were needed in order to get it to walk. Not to mention the difficulties of actually getting it to walk. Um, so uh, it's something which I will work towards, but at the moment, I, just having the thing trundle around the room, um, as far as I'm concerned, is enough of uh, an achievement. I have done some experimentation in the past with what they call bipedal or two-legged robots. So here's the thing that I, uh, this is just a basic frame of something that I had a few uh, years ago that had servos, one at the hip, one at the knee and one at the ankle. Um, that wasn't able to walk. Uh, dynamically like a human being can so basically it doesn't walk with a kind of swagger like we do it just kind of plonks one foot in front of the other and relies on its excessively large feet uh, in order to keep itself upright when it's standing still um, but again that's a, a step so to speak in, in the right direction and by scaling something like this up then I could uh, possibly um, work towards some, a, a proper full walker at some point um, I went to the bit that docked off that was, was a Raspberry Pi, because I used a Raspberry Pi in those days, along with uh, this uh, motor controller to make this thing walk. Um, and in fact, it says Raspberry Pi 2011 on it. So, one of the originals. Um, the other option, of course, rather than to 
just uh, go straight towards a walker is to go up a size in wheels. So that's the wheel that I've attached to the latest version. But I've also got some of these um, Omni wheels. Um, so these are about 150 centimeters in diameter as opposed to the 100 one less. Um, and as well as being able to drive in the normal direction, they've also got these little gray things on them which allow them to, to go sideways as well. So uh, that's another possibility for um, the future. Uh, robots like the, um, the SoftBank um, Pepper robots, the humanoid robot, has got three of these uh, built into its base and they're pretty much the same as these. So um, I may well, again, given time, work on that at some point in the future. And or I could go bigger again. Um, some of you who were at the Preston Raspberry Jam will have, probably remember um, this thing, which is my uh, robot uh, base unit made from a electric wheelchair motors. And uh, these are 30 centimeter diameter wheels. So it's uh, it, that's pretty humongous. It's got these whacking great motors on top as well. So that can actually pull a person around. So the plans I had for that were that at some point I might build something which was six or seven foot tall um, for a, uh, and, and maybe have a, you know, a mightier robot still than I've got at the moment, but we'll see. Uh, so I just thought I'd give you that little update as to where I am and um, see you again next month. There's a question I'd like to ask if it's okay, yep. which is you were talking about 3D printing and how long it was taken and the, the yep. particular component you talked about, I thought, I'm sure I could just take a flat piece of material and it would take me less time to, to cut and drill that. Yeah. In fact, the drilling, I'd probably do two at the same time to reduce yeah. and it wouldn't take me a whole day. No, you're right. Is it the, a sense, do no. you think, that you're printing things when you don't necessarily need to print them? No, um, it's not about that at all, because they... <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. Um, first of all, in order to do what you're talking about, if you're going to, let's say, add a sheet of um, I don't know, aluminium, for example, uh, it's more expensive. Aluminium is, is much more expensive than PLA. Uh, you would actually need other tools. So you're going to cut it straight. You need to have proper metal cutter. You can't go at it with a hacksaw. It'll take you, all, it'll take you longer to cut it with a hacksaw than it would be to 3D print it, probably. Uh, you'd also need a bench drill rather than just a regular drill if you're going to get accuracy there. Um, and you have to actually do it. Whereas if you're using a, a printer, you just simply, once you've done the design, drop it into the printer, go off and have a nice cup of tea. In fact, several cups of tea and uh, come back when it's ready. But those aren't the main reasons for me not doing it. The main reason is because my ultimate goal here is to create something that anybody can build with the minimum of equipment. So ultimately, all you would need, uh, I've got my, my 3D printer cost 150 quid four years ago. Um, so and you can get them for under a hundred pounds now. So anybody could go out, get themselves a cheap printer like that. You don't need any particular level of expertise. And in fact, if you are given or you buy the files that you need in order to print the parts off that you want, then the amount of expertise you re require is uh, really minimal. Um, and you don't need to worry about engineering precision and so on, because that's already built in um, into, the, into the machine. If that's set up properly, then it'll work and it'll give you perfect results every time. So, yes, the, the time side of things is a big um, disadvantage in many ways, unless you want to go down the route of a, a printer farm and have, you know, 10 of these things working simultaneously. Um, but, uh, but. That aside, its advantages far outweigh its disadvantages. Uh, besides which, it looks really pretty if it's printed off in red or orange or, or whatever. <laughs> and that's what it's all about, isn't it? Well, well, the the <laughs> well, it's not quite what it's all about, but the aesthetics of it, you know, is partly what it's about. Uh, do you think that there might be potential, or do they already exist, community 3D printer farms where, let's say you had a friend called Simon who also had a 3D printer, yeah. and another friend called Martin who also had a 3D printer that you could say, Simon, while you and Martin are away on holiday, can yeah. I come and do your and and then at some can point come around to your house, yeah, like a time, or you, or they could just drop it off at your house before they go on their holidays. They, they could do, yeah. I mean, they, these things are. I mean, some people might be quite precious about their printers. I know I would be about mine because they are quite a delicate thing. You know, if you if I move it from one bench to another, then it has to be recalibrated, and uh, that takes quite a bit of, bit of, of messing around. Um, and um, I mean, the other possibility is it, it, you can always 
have all the people print stuff for you. And there are services out there, but they're quite expensive. You know, you probably pay 20 quid a piece uh, to get it done. So it's not really cost effective, uh, certainly for the hobbyist uh, to, to be doing that sort of thing. So just having your own printer and having it properly calibrated. And that's part of the key. I mean, I, I, everybody goes to the same um, set of um processes when they first get one of these printers they print stuff off of it the strings of, of, of uh, filaments all over the place or it all goes blobby or it sticks to the or, or, it, or it doesn't stick to the bed and, and so on and so all that takes practice but uh, it's worth persevering with and uh, yeah is there a like a success ratio perhaps where you could say well every time i go to bed 10 30 11 and i can just set it to print and then when i come in the morning or because I know there's a bit of a failure rate, isn't there? Well, well, there is. Um, but I, I, I would be very careful about setting it and going to bed because if if some of the filament sticks to the head, uh, um, then you can you can then end up balling on the head and potentially I, I don't know whether it's ever happened or not. But I can see there's potential there for a fire breaking out. So you know I, I don't leave it completely unattended. When I, when I do long print jobs. I normally visit it every half an hour just to make sure that it's behaving itself. And Long enough to boil the kettle and soak well, the tea you, bag. Can off, you, you can just go off and do other stuff. You can do more design work if, if you're working on that project or, or something entirely different um, and then come back to it later. Uh, but yeah, in terms of failures, uh, part of it's down to how good your design is. I mean, I'm not a great designer. And what I, the way I tend to use it is almost like a scratch pad. I'll just kind of um, bung something together on on Tinkercad, uh, drop it into the into the printer, print it off, and see how it comes out. And if the parts don't fit together, then I'll modify it. And so when I did this, for example, the um, that that gear, which is attached to the to the wheel, um, this it, the depth of it was, was too great the first time I did it, so it was pushing up against the, the motor. So I just um, dropped it into um, back into Tinkercad, cut the end seven millimeters off the end of it, and reprinted it. And three hours later, I had a brand new one that I could put on and worked. I expect in the near future when you if you join our jam jar afterwards, mm -hmm. people, there'll be a lot of discussions about tips for 3D printing and ways that you could improve. Uh, well, I mean, I'm more than happy to, to share whatever, because I know when I started doing this three or four years ago, uh, I had no idea uh, of what I was doing at all. And stuff, I had all sorts of weird things happening, stripes appearing and stuff sticking um, to the bed in, a, in weird ways or not sticking. And so I've learned quite a lot over those last few years, and I'm more than happy if anybody else out there is, is where I was at that point. Or if they're further down the line and they've got a few tips on me, like, you know, if they turn around and go, Lewis Jones, that printout of yours is rubbish. Let me show you how to do it properly. Then, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to have a chat. Thank you very much, Gary. That is okay, fantastic. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm sorry we've had a few technical